Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to our course Physical Chemistry 101. My name is Dr. Louth and today's topic will be how fast or how slow does a chemical reaction proceed? That's the key question to rise in chemical kinetics. While in thermodynamics the question of affinity of drive delta G is critical, in kinetics you would ask what about reaction rate? Which parameters speed up or slow down the reaction? We consider a simple process. Reactant R transforms into product P. During this process we track the concentration of both reactant and product. The blue curve describes the dependence of the reactant's concentration with time and the slope of the curve represents the rate of decomposition R sub R. The red curve shows the concentration of the product P varying with time, the slope of this curve describing the rate of formation R sub P. The unit of the rates of decomposition and formation, concentration over time, that is moles per liter and second, for example. Formation rates are positive and decomposition rates are negative. By dividing them by the respective stoichiometric number, we get the classic reaction rate R without any subscript. Microscopically, chemical processes may be illustrated by the so-called reaction profile, something like a miniature golf course for molecules. A profile of potential energy in going from the reactant molecule to the product molecule, usually with an energy barrier. The energy barrier appears as a maximum in the energy profile, Reaction rate is influenced by the detailed cause of the reaction profile. In addition, the concentration of the reactant and temperature also are crucial for the reaction rate. In general, reaction rate will depend on a number of parameters like the solvent, the catalyst, temperature, phase boundary, concentration of reactant. We may keep the first four parameters constant and summarize them to the so-called reaction rate constant K. This mathematical expression R equals K times F of R is the reaction rate law. The reaction rate law gives the rate of a reaction as a function of the concentration of the reactant or reactants. The rate law can be predicted only for elementary reactions. Usually it has to be determined experimentally. The rate law often has the form of a power function. The exponent of the reactant concentration is called the order of the reaction. For reactions with multiple reactants, there may be several orders accordingly. The order indicates how sensitive the reaction rate responds to a change in concentration. Some examples. The decomposition of N2O5 is a first order reaction. The rate is proportional to the N2O5 concentration. The decomposition of NO2, on the other hand, is a second order reaction. The rate of this reaction is proportional to the square of NO2 concentration. The reaction CO plus N2O is overall second order, first order with respect to each of the reactants. The rate of enzymatic degradation of ethanol is not dependent on concentration. 
This, this is a zero order reaction. Fractional reaction orders are also possible. The decomposition of acetaldehyde follows a 1.5 order rate law. In a zero order reaction, the reaction rate is independent of the concentration of reactants and thus constant for the whole reaction sequence. This means that the concentration of a reactant decreases linearly with time. In a mechanical analogy for a zero-order reaction, we dip a ladle into a container, say a bathtub, R, carry an amount of liquid to the right, and empty the ladle into bathtub P. We keep doing so until bathtub R is empty. The level of each bathtub is a measure of the concentrations of R and P, respectively. The volume of the transport ladle is a measure of the rate constant K. The rate law is a differential equation. The derivation of the concentration of R in respect to time is a function of the concentration of R itself. By integrating, we may end up with concentration as a function of time, the so-called integrated rate law. For a zero-order reaction, the integrated rate law is a linear equation. An important characteristic of a kinetic process is the half-life, the time after which the concentration has dropped to half its initial value. Half-life can easily be calculated using the integrated rate law. The half-life of a zero-order reaction is not constant, but gets shorter as the reaction proceeds. In first-order reactions, reaction rate is proportional to the reactant concentration. Doubling concentration means doubling of the rate. In our mechanical analogy, we now transport the liquid with the pipette from bathtub R to bathtub P. This means that the amount of fluid transported is constantly getting smaller. The diameter of the pipette is correlated with the rate constant K. If we integrate the rate law for a first order reaction, we get an exponential function. The concentration decreases exponentially with time. Accordingly, half-life is constant. The decomposition of NO2 is a second-order process. The rate is proportional to the concentration of NO2 squared. When NO2 concentration drops to half, the rate will drop to a quarter. This nucleophilic substitution is first order with respect to each of the reactants and second order in total. The same applies for hydrolysis of esters, in this case first order with respect to acetate and hydroxide, total order 2. If we have a simple second order reaction and integrate the rate law, we'll end up with this relationship between reactant concentration and time. The half-life will thus increase when the reaction proceeds. R0 being the initial concentration of reactant R, it does take twice as long from half of R0 to quarter of R0 than from R0 to half of R0. If we perform a reaction like ester hydrolysis, with the reactants in non-stoichiometrical amounts, integration of the rate law is somewhat complicated. And we obtain this equation. If one of the reactants is present in large excess, however, this equation simplifies to a simple exponential function again, to a first-order reaction referred to as a pseudo-first-order reaction. Let's put together the most important equations for simple order reactions. For a zero order reaction, the reaction rate is constant. The integrated rate law provides a straight line. 
for a first order reaction, the half life is constant. The plot of logarithm of concentration versus time yields a straight line. For a second order reaction, the plot of the reciprocal of the concentration versus time gives a straight line. From the slopes of the lines, the rate constant k may be determined. Note that the rate constants have different units depending on reaction order. The half-life is constant only for a first-order reaction. For a zero-order reaction, it's getting shorter. For a second-order reaction, it's getting longer while the reaction proceeds. The concentration dependence of a reaction is described by the rate law. Now for its temperature dependence. In fact, the rate constant of most reactions is very sensible to temperature. In general, the constant increases greatly if we increase temperature. Van Chalk's rule of thumb states that 10 Kelvin temperature increase corresponds to a doubling of the constant rate. Arrhenius gives a more quantitative description of the KT relationship, the famous Arrhenius equation. Rate constant K equals A times E to the negative E over RT. E sub A is the activation energy in kilojoules per mole, and A is a frequency factor, a pre-exponential factor, which has the same unit as the rate constant. With these two parameters, the temperature dependence of a process may be completely described. The activation energy corresponding to the energy barrier in the reaction profile, which must be exceeded for the process to run, the frequency factor corresponding to the limit of the rate constant at infinitely high temperature. A direct plot of K versus T yields the Arrhenius exponential function. This function can be mathematically bent to a straight line just by plotting the logarithm of the rate constant against the reciprocal of the temperature, the famous Arrhenius plot. The slope of the line in the Arrhenius plot is related to the activation energy, and the axis intercept is related to frequency factor. Rate constants for arbitrary temperatures may be calculated using a Arrhenius equation. Let me give you an example. The decomposition of ethylamine was studied at different temperatures. The rate constants were plotted according to Arrhenius. The Arrhenius plot yields an intercept of 25.12. From this we can determine the frequency factor to about 8 times 10 to the 10th, 1 over second. The activation energy is obtained from the slope 176.4 kJ per mole. With both of these coefficients, we can now calculate the rate constant for any temperature by the Arrhenius equation. Let's look at the nucleophilic substitution reaction at molecular level. The reactants approach each other. Bonds are stretched, a new bond is formed. Generally, the potential energy of the reactants will increase. It reaches the maximum in the so-called activated complex or transition state. Thus, at the atomic level, a chemical reaction consists of the formation and the decomposition of an activated complex of a transition state. The activated complex of the transition state is abbreviated by a pound sign or number sign or hash sign. Analogously, we may sketch a reaction profile of the composition of hydrogen iodine into the elements. Two HI molecules collide, the potential energy increases, we reach the activated complex, pound sign, 
The activation energy, the energy difference between reactants and activated complex is 1.45 electron volts. After passing the activation energy mountain, the products hydrogen and iodine are formed. Energetically, the products are located on a 0.54 electron volts lower level than the reactants. This corresponds to the enthalpy of reaction. It's an exothermic reaction. We want to discuss the model substitution reaction in more detail and define the reaction coordinate. If you plot the potential energy of the three atom system A, B, C as a function both of the distance A, B and B, C, we obtain kind of a three-dimensional energy surface of this reaction. There are many paths which lead from the reactants to the products in this energy landscape. But there is a special path, some kind of valley line, passing the lowest energy barrier. This red line corresponds to the reaction coordinate. We can speed up a reaction clearly if we lower the energy of the transition state. This is done in catalysis in that a more complex pathway, the yellow one, is chosen, but this path has a lower activation energy. Minima in the reaction profile correspond to intermediates, maxima correspond to activated complexes, the pound sign again. A reaction consists of the formation and decomposition of a transition state. In the collision theory of kinetics, it is assumed that reactant particles must collide with a certain minimum energy to form the transition state. Most of the collisions will not reach this minimum energy, so they do not lead to the transition state. Only very few collisions are energetic enough to form the transition state. To use our landscape analogy, the energy of most collisions will not suffice to climb the activation mountain, path 1. Only very few collisions, path 2, will form the activated complex and then transform to the products. Energy distribution in a gas can be described by Maxwell Boltzmann. At 300 kelvins, only two parts per billion, two ppb, of all the particles have an energy of 50 kilojoules per mole or larger, corresponding to this integral of the Maxwell Boltzmann car. If we increase temperature only by 73 kelvins, this number will increase to 100 ppb. Accordingly, the rate of reaction will increase by a factor of 50. According to Eyring's theory of kinetics, there is a quasi equilibrium, some kind of steady state, between the reactants and the transition state. To reaching this equilibrium thermodynamically, we may calculate the concentration of the activated complex. Multiplying this concentration by a decomposition factor, Iring gives an equation for the rate and the rate constant of a second order chemical process. This Iring equation states that the reaction rate constant is determined by the activation enthalpy, delta H, pound sign, and the activation entropy, delta S, pound sign. Any factor influencing rate, for example, solvents or foreign ions, can be discussed by using Eyring's equation. Any activity that reduces the instability between the reactants and the transition state, delta G pound sign, will accelerate the reaction. We move from the black lines to the green lines. Any activity 
that increases this instability difference shown in red will slow down the reaction. Consider the reaction of a double positively charged cobalt complex with the hydroxide ion with this reaction profile in a nonpolar solvent. If we switch to a more polar solvent, we stabilize both the reactants and the transition state. However, the reactants will be more stabilized due to their greater charge and in the end will have an increase in free activation enthalpy delta G pulsar, slowing down the process. These kinds of ion reactions will be slower in a more polar solvent. The reverse is true for the reaction between uniformly charged ions. Here the reaction will speed up in polar solvents. Reactions between ions and neutral particles are unaffected by polarity and ionic strength. Thanks for watching. Bye.